Hey everyone, welcome back to PS113 Introduction to Psychology, Chapter 11, Personality Theory and Assessment, Part 3. When we left off on Part 2, it was talking about structure of personality and how the ego has to fight off the id and the superego at times. We're going to pick up there and then discuss defense mechanisms and Freud's psychosexual stage theory of personality. Probably his most controversial thinking of all. Well, again, the ego normally does a good job of keeping the id and the superego in check, but sometimes it gets overwhelmed and it calls in reinforcements. Kind of like the troops coming over the hill as a defense against getting run over by the id and the superego. These are defense mechanisms, and a defense mechanism is a kind of closing your eyes, like an ostrich burying her head in the sand, hoping the problem will go away if you don't look at it. It's a lie of sorts that we tell ourselves to distort reality and banish the conflict to the unconscious and get on with our lives. We all do this to some extent, and it's not normally a problem. But, if you use defense mechanisms 24-7, then this could result in significant personality problems. Some of the more common defense mechanisms include repression, projection, displacement, and rationalization. Here's an example of rationalization. A friend of yours interviews for a job but was disappointed to learn he didn't get it. Now, he says management already knew who they wanted to hire. There may be some truth to that statement, right? Because it always helps to know people on the inside. That makes some sense. But, what could be the real reason why our friend didn't get the job? Perhaps he was not qualified or didn't have the right experiences. Perhaps he came off poorly in the interview. He was inappropriate in some things he said or did or just by the way he was dressed. That may be the truth, but the reality of this may be a little too painful for our friend's ego. So the solution the ego comes up with is to use rationalization because it's a logical explanation and people will accept it even though it's not true. Let's look at Freud's most controversial idea in psychoanalysis, the psychosexual stages of development. And these are the oral stage, anal, phallic, featuring the oedipal complex and the, and the electric complex, latent, and genital. Freud theorized that a baby is born into the world in the oral stage for the first couple years of life. He called it oral because the mouth through biting, chewing, and sucking gives the baby a lot of satisfaction. Breastfeeding is a source of life. The baby needs the contact comfort for proper attachment and bonding, and the mouth is a source of pleasure. Parents have known for thousands of years that the baby, however, must eventually be weaned. This means we get the baby off the nipple and teach them how to drink from a cup. Parents have always tried to get the timing of this just right, but Freud took it a step further than anyone had before. He said, if you wean the baby too early, or if you waited too late and overindulged the baby, that this will shape his or her personality. At around age one to three years old, the infant enters the anal stage. And what is the parenting issue here? Everybody knows. 
toilet training. The small child learns to get control of his or her bowel and bladder. The retention and then the release of elimination products gives pleasure in the anus. Now again, parents have known throughout history that we do potty training. And if you do this too early and are severe and punishing, or if you're permissive and allow for a lot of mistakes and messiness, it can have a major influence on the child's personality when they grow up. This is psychoanalysis. The child enters the phallic stage at approximately three or four years old. Here, the parenting challenge is to deal with the child's emergent sexuality. It's not unusual for children at this age to start asking questions such as, where do babies come from? Why do boys have a penis? Now they may not use that word of course. And girls don't. Did the girls lose it? There may be some touching or rubbing of the genitals that clearly gives some faint stirrings of pleasure to the child. And finally, boys may ask, Mommy, can I marry you when I grow up? Or girls, Daddy, will you marry me? The challenge here is how to answer these questions and deal with those issues. Once again, if you're too stern or punishing to those questions, or if you're overly permissive and indulgent in response to these behaviors, it will affect emerging personality. This crush on the opposite sex parent is called the Oedipal complex for boys and the Electra complex for girls. Freud believed that little children at this age wanted to possess the opposite sex parent and were jealous of the same sex parent. Sooner or later, the child learns that they can't have the opposite sex parents all to their own. This is when the child moves into the latency period, which roughly begins at around age five or six and lasts until puberty. Any feelings of sexuality are now repressed and underground, and there's a period of sexual calm. The genders have same-sex friends. Boys tend to run with boys and girls with girls. In fact, if you asked a boy at this age, do you have a girlfriend? He might say, no, girls have cooties. The repressed sexual energy is now channeled into school, sports, and hobbies. It's also a period of intense identification with the same-sex parent. Boys, having come through the Oedipal conflict, now want to be like Daddy. They want to walk and talk and do the things that Dad does. And in the same way, girls identify with Mother, and Mother is a role model to them. You are a superstar in the eyes of your child at this age and you may never have more influence on your child than during these years. The last stage of psychosexual development is genital and this begins at about age puberty. There's a revival of sexual interests in the establishment of mature sexual relationships. Boys and girls now become much more interested in each other and spend more time with each other. We come to the end of part three, <coughs> excuse me, on chapter 11, and some of Freud's contributions, the influence of early childhood. Before Freud, no one really made the connection that early childhood experiences could affect adult personality. Freud was a big proponent of unconscious motivation and I think all of us accept the idea that we may do things from time to time 
where we don't fully understand why. Maybe not to the extent that he did, but I think everybody takes this for granted. Defense mechanisms. The idea that we have to tell little white lies and distort reality to cope with conflicts. And talk therapy. Before Freud, there were no shrinks. Freud was the first person that you talked to about psychological problems in the medical community. Anybody who's interested in becoming a counselor or who has benefited from counseling owes Freud a debt of gratitude for that. Now, what are some of the common criticisms? One, too much emphasis on sex. And that was controversial way back in his day. Today we have a new group of Freudians who minimize the emphasis of sex and point to more social explanations for behavior. And I would say the biggest criticism, it's hard to test scientifically. It's hard to test these things involving unconscious processes. As I, I, people have told me before, that the problem with psychoanalysis is not that it may be false, it may be true. It's very hard to use the scientific method to really evaluate it. Well, that's all for now. Bye-bye. Talk with you later.